there's a request by a juror to be excused due to financial hardship. And it's the same juror who had an issue. and I respond uh, to this note. What says the state? Well, Judge, um, this is the juror that has already technically been removed from the jury. He's, he's not aware of it. Um, we did note that uh, he did not indicate any hardship when we did the general questioning. My concern, it's more of a, it's more of a, uh, his uh, behavior and attitude has definitely not been the most respectful towards the proceedings in this particular case. Um, and to a certain extent, you hate to reward uh, that kind of behavior. Um, that being said, the state would leave it in the court's discretion as to how you think it's best to proceed. Um, and just, you, know, you hate to reward behavior where it appears that someone is purposely attempting to get out of jury service. How do you feel like it would uh, infect the rest of the jury? Well, it could. I mean, it could definitely. And the other jurors may say, hey, if I act this way, and I, I have financial hardship, I don't want to be here anymore. Maybe if I act this way, maybe I can get off, too. And that's the other concern. Um, my concern is that he infects the jury pool. And he's just, um, you know, yeah. mean that his attitude means that, you know, he speaks poorly of us all and uh, poisons the jury against the whole thing. Um, that's my concern if we leave him there. But so, I would defer to the court. Well, there, there are two concerns. Right? There is that and then the opposite, which has been referenced here. Okay. I don't know what it's quite an opposite, but it's, it's, it's a different concern and also a real concern. Um, I'm going to deny the request. Send the note back and then ask the note be given back to Bob so that it's part of the record. Any objections? Any objections? Thanks. None to the state. Okay. Um, this is my response. It's Dear Mr. I have discussed this matter with counsel for the state and counsel for the defense and they have left the matter to my discussion. I have concluded that this request should not be granted respectfully. And I sign my name and give my time. Okay. This way, take it out on me, but not on you. And if you after to spread that, if you would just return it uh, to the court. Yes, we need to be back on. We have a second. And we'll just wait until we get dressed both. Okay, this is a uh, requirement. Okay, uh, this is a lengthy note, and uh, it's uh, five. Parts. Uh, so what I'm going to do is uh, use the same procedure I did with the last one, which is uh, mark it. I'm going to give it to counsel to read, and then we'll discuss it. I can answer in writing by saying that the objection. 
No objection. Let's see. Two. Will the jurors be given an explanation of the terms referenced in the indictment? Yes. During the charge of the court, which will occur after closing arguments. That is all. Yes, please. Three. Will there be any reference information to be used outside of the notes taken by jurors? May our notes be shared during deliberation? <coughs> This is a little bit of a trickier question because I'm not sure that I understand exactly what he means by reference information. <coughs> I think that the answer is no. Uh, the case will be decided on the evidence presented. charge of the court. And the, uh, as it relates to the notes issue, uh, they may use notes to refresh their recollection, but each of the jurors must decide this case on their own. I don't know, I don't believe that there is uh, anything more that really needs to be said in that regard. Judge, I wonder if um, the way we respond to this is um, you will have the evidence um, that has been um, ad admitted during the course of the trial and the charge of the court. Um, you will not be permitted to use any outside reference materials. Because I'm not sure from the question this evening, are we going to be able to see all the evidence that's being admitted? And of course, all of that will go back except for the ones that um, have some rule preventing them from going back to the jury. So maybe that would help address, like, yes, you will be able to see, for example, the photographs, those types of things will be back there, but you won't be able to do any other independent research. Um, and I almost wonder if we, if we go to the last question, I almost wonder if the court uh, wants to, it was going to allow him to share this response with the other jurors. I almost wonder if it might be more prudent to address any of these concerns to the jurors in open court. That way we know exactly what's being told to them and it's not there's not a discussion going on in the back. Yeah, I'm happy to uh, Ms. Maldew, please. Yes. I'm happy to take the note and to read the note and to then share our responses and then send them back. I think that'd be best. Yes. Okay. So you prefer that I say yes to the reference material, but to identify the reference material essentially as the evidence. Correct. So I will say if we're going to be addressing them in open court, then perhaps I don't write any responses at all. Take time with that So I'm just simply going to strike through everything that I've written. And we'll uh, bring them out and address all of the questions. Okay, so now we have to uh, determine the best way to deliver the notes. Um, I would suggest that the first thing that we do is address the group. Uh, and then after we've addressed the group and have them return to the jury room, then we deliver the, the first note to juror number 60. That's fine, Jeff. Okay. Let's have the jury step out.
Ladies and gentlemen, uh, good morning and welcome back. Um, we have a question uh, that's in five parts uh, that came from uh, one of the jurors. And, uh, because of the nature of the question, uh, I felt it was important after conferring with the parties uh, to speak to you as a group regarding these questions. And so I'm just going to go ahead and do that uh, now. I'm going to read the question and I'll give you the response. The first question is, will there be an opportunity to review the indictment in full? Will this happen during deliberation? Uh, the answer is yes. You will be given a copy of the indictment in full and you'll be able to review it starting at the beginning of your deliberations. Number two is, will the jurors be given an explanation of the terms referenced in the indictment? It says, for example, assault versus battery and first degree versus second degree, etc. The answer is yes. During the charge of the court, what is the charge of the court? Well, those are my instructions. That's the law that's applicable in the case. So you receive the explanation at that time. And that will occur after the evidence is closed and after the attorneys have made their closing arguments. Okay? Number three, will there be any reference information to be used outside the notes taken by jurors? May our notes be shared during deliberation? The answer is the only reference information to use the term in the note that you will be permitted to use will be the evidence that has been admitted during the trial of the case. If there have been photos admitted, or there have been records admitted, uh, then you would have those documents with you. But that would be a reference information. may not have some of the written statements that are admitted, because that would be a violation of what's called a continuing witness rule. And that will be determined at the conclusion of the case. May your notes be shared during deliberation. Well, that will be up to you to decide. But each of you are required to decide this case on your own. And how you do that is up to you. Okay? <clears throat> Number four, will the schedule during deliberation be different than the schedule we are currently using during the trial? No. We expect a nine to five schedule. And you can plan for that. Number five, is it permissible to share the responses to these questions with other jurors? The answer is yes. Uh, but I think we've addressed that. All right. Uh, thank you, and you can step back in. Okay, any objection to the comments of the court's committee? Not the state. All right. 
you can deliver the second time you wish. Let's just wait two minutes and then we'll get started. Okay. Let's have the jury step out. Stay right in your seat. Yes, sir. Please call your next witness. State calls Amanda Harrell. Amanda Harrell. Please raise your right hand. Do you solemnly swear or affirm the testimony you shall give this court shall be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth to help you, God? Yes. And can you please state and spell your name? Amanda Harrell. A M A N D A H A R R I L L. And Ms. Harrell, how do you know Millie Harrell? She's my daughter. And how did she come to be your daughter? Um, I became a foster parent um, in August of 15. And through the course of the time, um, her younger sisters were placed with me. And then a little bit more time came, then we were blessed to have her come with us. And why did you become a foster parent? Um, it just kind of presented itself. I had learned um, through a friend more about fostering, and um, I was married. I didn't have any kids. Um, and the more I thought about it, I had a loving home to offer, and I had a flexible job that gave me a, you know, the freedom to be able to provide what was needed. And then it just kind of took off from there. And before um, Millie's younger sisters, how many foster children did you have? None. They were your first? My first and only. Okay. Now, how old was Millie when she first came to live with you? Six. Six. And how old was Millie's younger sisters when they came to live with you? Um, Carly was um, just shy of a month, and Hannah was seven weeks, I believe. When was the first time you met Millie? I had met Millie, I don't remember ever seeing her at any court hearings, but I believe the first time I ever met her was when a, our transporter for visitations, um, a few times, due to scheduling changes, she would pick Millie up before she would come to get Carly, and I had the opportunity just to briefly meet her in the backseat of the car as I was buckling Carly. When you say um, visitations, what kind of visitations were taking place? Um, the girls had um, visitations with um, either Tessa, you know, or the sisters. You know, eventually we got to where we had, you know, sibling visits. And um, a transporter would pick up uh, Carly from me and then take her to wherever the visits were taking place. And was the transporter someone employed by DFACS? Um, I think it was, it was an outside company that DFACS employs to do their transporting. I think they do home studies and stuff as well. Now, how did um, how did you learn of Layla's death? The night that Layla died, I received a call. Um, I believe it was from a caseworker from Henry County or someone from DFAX um, requesting the number to my foster agency's uh, emergency intake line. Um, during that call, they did say that um, Carly's sister, you know, had tragically passed away and that they were looking for possibly emergency placements of Millie. Um, they asked if I would take her, and I said yes. Um, and then that was the end of it. Yeah. At the time of that phone call, had you met Millie those few times with the transporter? Yes. Oh, no, no, no. No, I had not. No. Okay. So at the time of that phone call, you had not met Millie no. at all? No. Carly had only been with me maybe five weeks. And after those first few um, interactions, brief interactions with the transporter, when is the next time you met Millie? I, I might have seen her in court, but I, I don't think so. Um, in July of 17, we um, visit schedules kind of changed, and um, we moved the visit. The, the, it, at this point, it was a sibling visit, and we moved the location to my house. 
And then so Millie started coming to visitations at my house. So what happened between the phone call you got on November 17, 2015, asking you if you would take Millie and July 2017? I asked that a lot too. Um, when I agreed, it was obviously things were chaos. It was late at night. Um, I didn't hear back from them. Um, and so, of course, I am frantically trying to figure out what's about to happen and am I now going to, you know, am I making changes for, you know, room for a four-year-old? Um, and as I waited and waited and I, things kind of changed and then all of a sudden defects came back and had a concern because I had a pool, I had dogs and um, they wanted those things addressed. So by, you know, then my dogs were cleared and everything was fine and then I had to add an additional fence to the pool and by the time I was able to get that taken care of, uh, Millie had already been placed in another home, so they said she's going to stay where she is. And how, um, how did it come about that after July of 2017, Millie actually ended up with you after being placed somewhere else? Um, my understanding is she went to a couple different places in between a couple phone calls I got asking if she could come, you know, live with us. I always said yes when I got that phone call. Um, and then sibling visits started um, at our house. Um, and, you know, defects had kind of started talking about permanent placements and what that was going to look like and wanting the sisters together. Um, and then she came to visits. We took her on a family vacation with us. And at that point, um, she was placed with Peggy Banks. And when we got back from our Thanksgiving vacation to the beach, when I was transitioning Millie back to Peggy, she mentioned that she felt that um, Christmas or winter break would be a good time for Millie to transition into my home. And step back a little. You went on a family vacation with the three girls in yes. November of 2017? Yes, we invited um, Millie to go with us. And at that time, where was Millie living? With Peggy Banks. And when you, whose um, idea was it at that time for Millie to transition to live in your home? Um, I wanted her the, you know, the entire time, but um, it wasn't until there was, um, Peggy was wanting her to stay with her, but then she mentioned it. Um, she knew that I, obviously I was open to it and wanted that to happen, um, but then she had changed her mind and thought that that was what was best for Millie. When did Millie officially move into your home? Um, she officially moved in on December 27th of 17. And did you spend that Christmas with Millie? I did. Christmas was very big to our family, so I wanted to make sure she was with us. And after December 27 of 2017, um, was Millie permanently with you up until yes. this time? Yes. And were you present for the um, hearing regarding the termination of Tessa's parental rights and the, the father's? Mm -hmm. And when was, what was that date? June 8th. Of what year? Oh, of, of 18. And what was the date that Millie and her sisters were officially adopted? 3 18 19. Now, at the time that Millie began to live with you on, in December of 2017, how old was she? Six. And at that time, what, if anything, did you know about Millie's first six years of her life? I didn't know a, a, a lot of information. I knew um, she had been in several different places. Um, obviously, I knew I had heard that she was um, in the home where her sister passed away, um, that, you know, there was, you know, potentially, you know, some issues that she may have been through. Um, just trauma in general from all of the moving, things that she had experienced and been a part of. Um, but that was about it. Did you know anything about Millie's medical history prior to um, her coming to stay with you? Mm -hmm. and, and how come you didn't have any of her medical history? Um, well, I'm not actually you know, privy to that information until she's technically placed in my home. But even when she was placed with me, um, any medical information was hard to get. Anything, when she, her time in Henry County, I was just told that no one could access that information, so they had nothing to give 
to me, but that when she was adopted, then I would have all medical records. And at this time, have you been able to get all of Millie's medical records? No. I have very spotty records. And were you, were you at the time that you adopted or started fostering Millie, uh, were you able to get any of the DFAX records? No. Did you know um, Tessa Daniel prior to fostering Millie and her sisters? No. Did you know Millie or her sister's biological fathers prior to fostering Millie and her sisters? Yes. And did you know Peggy, pa Peggy Banks prior to fostering Millie? No. Since fostering um, Millie and then adopting Millie, have you um, met Tessa Banks? Um, I'm sorry, briefly, Tessa um, Yes. Yes, briefly in uh, court. We have had uh, email conversations. And since fostering and adopting Millie, have you had um, conversations with Peggy Max? Yes. Now, when Millie first came to live with you, um, what kind of child was she? Um, sweet, energetic. Um, you know, we, she had trust issues. She had a very hard time just trusting almost anything, um, I think rightfully so. Um, she um, loved being with her sisters and was great to, you know, help take care of them, you know, per se. Um, you know, she would have some attention-seeking behaviors. Um, I think coming now all of a sudden being back in the oldest of two and, um, you know, just wanting to have my attention, you know, at times. And as I think a typical six-year-old will do, they'll get it any way they can get it. And what kind of things would she do to get your behavior? Um, she would just, um, you know, wouldn't maybe do something when I asked her to do it or um, if I would tell her to go brush her teeth or get in the shower or, you know, make up her clothes or her toys. Um, or she would tell me she did do those things. And then I would, you know, of course, come to find the clothes still on the floor or her toothbrush was dry. Um, you know, things like that. Now... What does Millie do, or how does she act when she gets nervous? She um, gets this kind of funnier, you know, giggle, laugh. Um, she tends to make grand gestures when she's lying, um, and um, she talks. She either goes really quiet, or she tries to over-talk. So you've seen Millie do a, a giggle or a laugh when she gets nervous? Yes. Now, how often um, have you and Millie talked about the death of her sister, Layla, as well as Millie's experiences at the Rosenbaums? Um, very rarely. It's definitely something that she does not want to talk about. I don't push the issue. Uh, we talk about Layla all the time, we, um, but we just don't talk about her experiences. When you talk about Layla, what kind of things are you talking about? Um, talk, she'll tell me about things that Layla liked to do, you know, what she was like. And, um, you know, she'll just, like, you know, tell stories of they would read, you know, she would read a book, you know, to Layla, those kind of things. Um, and how come um, Millie doesn't like talking about the, her experience at the Rosa Homes? I would object. That's a question that can't be answered by the party why Millie... Um, that do something um, or would feel a certain way that's asking for speculation. That witness may have first-hand knowledge from Millie. Uh, I'll sustain the objection. Now, has Millie ever told you anything about what happened to her while living at the Rosenbaums? Um, she has made um, a couple brief statements, um, you know, throughout the course of our time together. How would these statements begin? How would they come up? Very, very random. Um, you know, looking back, I still can't ever think about how it would come up. We may just be in the car and she would just make a statement. Um, or we might be talking about something, you know, that we want for dinner, and then she'll go into why she doesn't want something. Um, but then she makes a statement and moves on. Have you ever asked her directly about what happened at the Rosenbaum? No. And when Millie would make these statements, would you ask her questions? No.
What exactly has Millie told you about what happened to her at the Rosenbaum's? She's, um, I think, mentioned four different things that had happened. Um, one of them being that um, she and Layla would get in trouble if they fell asleep in the car and they would receive spankings if they, um, they would get in trouble and or receive spankings if they ever fell asleep in the car. Did she tell you anything else? She said um, at one time she wasn't doing something fast enough, so Jennifer twisted her ankle and sat on her. And when she told you this, did you ask her any more questions? I didn't because I don't, I have no information as to what happened. And I, I mean, never having, you know, a child this age, especially a child of trauma, I didn't want to ever make it worse. I didn't want to make her talk about something because when she would make these statements, it was a one and done. She would say it and before she could finish that sentence, she had already changed the subject. And it was clear she did not want to talk about it. What was the the fourth thing that she told you about? Being okay, uh, thinkings, um, but she had said um, at one point she um, that she was forced to eat mashed potatoes until she vomited, and then was forced to eat the vomit. And how did that statement come up? Um, we were talking about things. Um, always trying to come up with different things to have for dinner um, becomes challenging that you have three kids that will eat. Um, so I'm always trying to get them to tell me things that they like because if they tell me they like it, then they can't sit at the table and tell me they don't. And so we talked about potatoes and, you know, did she like potatoes of any kind? And she said, no. And that's when this topic of mm -hmm. mashed potatoes came up. Mm -hmm. Now, other than what Millie has told you, do you know anything else about... Um, how Millie was injured at the Rosenbaum's. No. Okay. And other than um, what Millie has told you, do you know anything else about Layla's death? Um, you know, obviously when this first happened, um, you know, I definitely followed along any media coverage, any, you know, articles in the newspaper, you know, anything that was published, you know, when it happened. Have you ever um, told Millie about what you've learned in the media? No. Now, you've been in the courtroom for most of this trial, mm -hmm. and at any point have you gone home and told Millie about what you've heard in court? No. Have you ever gone home and questioned Millie about things that were said in court? No. One thing, I do want to say one thing. We did talk about, like, procedural. You know, she would ask what happened, and I would be like, we selected a jury today, or we listened to people talk, but never anything that was said, but we did talk about, like, picking jury. And why have you been in the courtroom for most of the trial? Because I'm her mother. And have you um, been able to learn some information about Millie's past since being in the courtroom? Mm hmm And is that important to you? Very. Okay. It's hard to not know what your child's been through. Now, at the time that Millie came to live with you, was she seeing a therapist named Ann McCullough? She was. And when Millie came to live with you, did you continue to take her to see Anne? I did. And was there a time when you, Millie, and Millie's great-grandmother, Peggy Panks, uh, mm -hmm. met with Miss McCullough? We did. And how did that meeting come about? Um, in just kind of passing, I felt that Millie may see Peggy and I, you know, having kind of a loyalty issue, and I thought that if she could see Peggy and I together as a united front, wanting nothing but the best for her, that might help her, you know, just feel better, you know, just when she gets uneven about things and the transition. And during that meeting, um, did you go through um, Millie's different placements with her? Yes, because I had no, you know, or concrete uh, knowledge of her background. And was Peggy Banks the one that kind of gave you that information? She did. Mm -hmm. And during that meeting, did you ever discuss or Millie ever talk about her time at the Rosenbaums? Mm -mm, not, not, we just, that wasn't talked about when I, in the sessions that I was part of, other than their place in the timeline. 
Why did, um, well, at some point did Millie stop seeing Ann McCullough? Yes. Um, Ann's office is in McDonough. We live in Noonan. Um, so it just wasn't, after a while, it just became troublesome to drive that far, you know, each and every week when I could find something closer. And how far was the drive from your place to Ann's? Um, I think it was about an hour. We would come from different places from school or whatnot, but I think it was roughly an hour. And you would be doing that about once a week? Mm -hmm. Do you know if Millie told Ann about anything about the death of her sister? I believe she did, yes. But you don't, no one has. I don't know any specifics as to what was said. Do you know what, if anything, Millie told Anne about living, herself living with the Rosenbaums, her experience? I know that she did, but I don't know the specifics as to what she said. When did Millie stop seeing Anne? I believe it was in March of 18. And after March of 2018, did Millie um, see another therapist? Um, a couple months later, we did. We started up with one closer to home. So that would be approximately May of 2018. Um, I believe we started in July, July of 18. And what was the reason that you took Millie to see um, Donna, the, the other therapist? Um, you know, honestly, I just she had been, you know, in counseling for you know, so long, um, you know, what little I did hear about what she had been through, I felt anyone would need continued counseling and therapy, and so I felt it was best to continue what she had already been And doing. at that time, um, did you, ha were you also seeking some guidance or help in how to, to parent a six-year-old? Yes. Um, you know, my situation's a little bit more unique. I didn't have any children of my own before I started fostering. So I was learning day by day um, as the little ones were um, getting older. And then when Millie came, I had never parented a three, a four, a five, or a six-year-old, let alone a child with trauma in her history that I wanted to make sure that I was doing it right and I wasn't, you know, I don't think any parent knows what they're doing, but I wanted to... I wanted to make sure I was overly cautious that I wasn't going to cause her any trauma or anything like that. And how often would Millie see Donna? Um, I would say um, on average three, uh, three times a month. You know, schedules would come up and, you know, but I would say on average three times. And what, if any, concerns did you bring to Donna's attention? Um, Similar to the ones I, you know, mentioned before, you know, attention-seeking behaviors, um, getting into, you know, really telling lies and just, you know, why not brush your teeth, you know? How do I, you know, turn this around so we can, you know, just get to doing things, maybe the first or second time I ask her to do it versus the fifth or sixth. And was Donna able to um, teach you some techniques on how to handle or parent a six-year-old? Yeah, she would always have, you know, ideas for whatever. Because I would just ask, almost any time she came, I would have some sort of scenario that I'd be like, what do you think? So she came. Um, where did the sessions take she place? She would come to the house. She came to our house. Now, was there a time that Millie discussed um, Layla's death at school? Yes. Okay. And was that brought to your attention? It was. And was this um, discussion brought to Donna's attention? It was. And how come you brought it to Donna's attention? Um, because Millie doesn't talk about what happens. So any time she does, you know, I feel the door is open and I want to know, is there a reason, like, was there a trigger that brought her that wanted to talk about it? What caused it? And if she wanted to talk about it now, I wanted to make sure she had the avenues to do it in the best way for her. Did you talk to Millie about um, that conversation she had at school about Layla's death? I did. And 
was Millie able to tell you why um, she discussed Layla's death? Um, it started with um, a prayer request at school that morning, and um, you know there was you know some of her classmates were sharing, you know, um, a passing of a grandparent or a, a sick family member, and I think she want she wanted to participate in the conversation. And why was this conversation concerning to you? Um, it's very heavy information for children. Um, I was, you know, concerned that Millie was now wanting to talk about it, but unfortunately, it wasn't with appropriate people. And what exactly did Millie say to her classmates? Um, she told them that her sister was killed. Um, I think that it kind of had come up in multiple times throughout the day. So, um, I mean, I have the order of what was said and when, but um, I was told that she had said that her sister was killed. Um, her sister had been choked, at one point choked on chicken, that um, her, uh, I believe she said organs had been split in two. And or cut in half, maybe. Cut in half. And when you first approached Millie about what she had told her classmates, um, did she deny that she had said it? Yes. Okay. Um, and at that point, did you have a conversation with her about being honest with you? Yes. And at that point, at some point, did she eventually tell you? Eventually. Mm -hmm. And during that conversation, uh, well, let me ask you this. Is Millie, um, in your experience, able to distinguish what she's heard and what she's personally observed with her own eyes? I think so. You often get out of the perspective and asking for a conclusion for a conclusion she can't possibly know what you know, hears or, or observes. As based on her personal knowledge. You will notice. <clears throat> Was Millie able to tell you how she knew the information that she told you about her sister's death? Um, when it kind of came down to it, she was like, well, I think I heard that. And as of today's date, does Millie still continue to see Donna? Yes, she does. And do you at all know um, Jennifer Rosenbaum? No, I do not. And do you at all know um, Joseph Rosenbaum? No. Do you have any relationship with any of Millie or her other sister's family members? No. Thank you. No more questions. Cross. Good morning, Ms. Harrell. I just have a number of questions for you. My name is Kareem Mo. Uh, you've been sitting in the courtroom since the beginning of trial, haven't you? I have. So you've heard what all the witnesses have said. Mm -hmm. You've seen all the pictures. You have um, listened to all. You have seen all the exhibits, exhibits that have been yes. filed. And um, it's true, isn't it, that um, when you, excuse me, just a second. Um, you had an occasion with Millie where um, Hannah, and Hannah is Merci, isn't it? Yes. That was her name mm -hmm. uh, by her biological mother was Merci. Yes. And uh, she's now Hannah. She is. Um, there was a time where you were um, you were exposed to the fact that uh, Hannah fell down or hurt herself, was pushed, uh, and had some bru bruising, and that Millie was the one who had pushed her, correct? 
I don't remember that specifically. You don't remember, you don't remember ever coming, reporting to DFACS that uh, Hannah had gotten hurt and you, not, none of the girls would tell you how it happened. She kept- Oh, okay, I know, yes. So that, that did happen? Yes. Okay, and so uh, none of the girls would tell you what happened, including Millie, and- uh, In the beginning. In the beginning, and then uh, ultimately she fessed up to the fact that she had lied. Mm -hmm. Is that a yes? Yes. And you've had lots of diaper rashes with the, the girls that you have now, the two younger ones, sisters of Millie. Carly yes. had, had several diaper rashes. Okay. Now, with regards to um, Donna Wazorek, it's fair to say, isn't it, that basically she was she was brought into the picture to help Millie prepare for trial? No. No. That is something that would have been discussed, but that's not the reason. So that was not one of, one of the reasons? No. And isn't it true that Anna Wazork has attempted to prepare her for trial? <coughs> Depends on what you mean by prepare. They have talked about it, that she needs to get up here and, to be, and be honest. And that has been a problem for Millie all along, not just while you've had her, correct? As far as lying? Yes. So, um, I would say about little things, um, brushing her hair. But you don't know her history other than the time she has been with you, correct? I do not know. No. And um, it's fair to say that great, great grandma has a great deal of influence on Millie, correct? I would say while she was living with her. And um, Millie and her great-grandmother um, would have conversations, isn't that correct? I'm not privy to the conversations they had. But you were privy to the results of those conversations, weren't you? You were privy to the fact that mm -hmm. you're... Well, the results of, of the conversations with, with Millie, with her grandmother, how Millie acted when she was back home. That's what you're getting to? Yes, I'll, I'll rephrase. Okay, thank you. Your daughter, Millie, had problems with lying. Yes. You say about little things. Little things, lying. yes. She also had a problem with doing what her grandmother told her she could do and you told her she could not do, correct? As, can you give me an example? Uh, no, I can't give you an example. I'm asking you a question. Isn't it true that her grandmother would tell her things that you then would object to? Oh, yes, I thought you meant telling her she could do something and I was telling her she couldn't do something. You had, you had issues with what was going on with her grandmother. Yes, there was a few things I had issues with. And uh, in fact, those were discussed with Donna Wazork, and Donna Wazork being the therapist, mm -hmm. and um, there were requests that when Millie was with her great-grandmother or her mother during the visitation period with her mother, excuse me, that um, they have appropriate conversations, that they not engage in inappropriate conversations. Well, I can't, um, are you saying when she visitations with Tessa? Yes. Millie did not have any visitations once she moved in with me, so I can't you don't say know that. About that. But no, I definitely, you know, asked Peggy to have, you know, be mindful of when Millie was around and what was said in front of her. And in fact, she was telling things about both the Rosenbaums and Layla's, Millie and Layla's family. I, I don't, I wasn't there, so I can't say for sure. Okay. What was it that you were seeing that caused you to tell Peggy that you did not want her having these conversations with her? Um, one of them was um, saying that the only reason I wanted Millie to come and live with me was so the two younger sisters would stay with me. And uh, that you knew to be a lie. It was, because I said yes you know, from the night Layla died and several times after that for Millie to come live with us. So to your knowledge, Peggy, if Peggy did in fact tell her that, she I, lied. Yeah. 
Well, I don't know if Peggy is, I can't say that Peggy was lying because I don't know if she knew um, until much later into this process and Millie was living with me that I had mentioned all the times that I wanted Millie to come be with us and she seemed surprised. So I don't know when she said those things. I just know that I had a problem with her saying that to Millie. One of the treatment goals was to significantly reduce the frequency or eliminate lying altogether, wasn't it? No parent wants her child to lie, so yes, that was absolutely a goal. Yes, yes. the answer. Yes. yes. And um, she was getting in trouble at school for lying, correct? <gasps> Once, twice maybe. She was getting in trouble at school. Is that a yes? Yes. Now... She would, you would hear what she had to say to Donna was Zork. Not all the time. No, some, I was there for some sessions, and other sessions they were not. But you me. were there for some sessions. Some of them, yes. And um, it's true that one day you felt she made some statements that caused you to follow Donna was Zork out the door and tell her that you had concerns that some of the memories M Millie was having were not true, were not correct. I remember saying that I was under the impression something different had happened. But again, I had no knowledge of specifically what happened. So I, every, every time the sessions were over, I went outside with Donna to, to recap. Okay, well, I'm asking you a question, a very specific question. Did you go outside and say to Donna Wazork that you were concerned the memories Millie was speaking about were not true? Did you on that one day do that? I don't remember specifically that day, but it is it is possible, yes. It's possible. Yes, absolutely. There also were instances that um, Donna and you discussed where you felt that she made up her own past experiences, correct? Yes. And you don't know really how she was at age three or four. You just nope. know her from, from six. Mm -hmm. So you don't know what her history was for lying back then. No, I don't. Um, I'm going to show you what I... show you what I've marked as Defendant's Exhibit 15 and ask you if you can identify this. Yes, that is a picture of Carly and Millie at um, the girls' birthday party at my house for Hannah and Carly. Um, I would tender Defendant's Exhibit 15 into evidence, Your Honor, at this time. No objection. May I publish? This is an image of Meyer, so that's the Okay. If we could get the lights, I would appreciate that. Is this an accurate picture of Millie at what age? Um, that would have been, that was a girl's first and second birthday, so she would have been six. So who would she have been living with at the time? Peggy Banks. Okay. And uh, these bruises we see on her legs, what, uh, did you question anybody about them? No. Did you uh, report them to defects? No. 
Thank you. I'm looking for on this picture. We'll show you the birds 14 and see if you can identify that for us. That is a picture in one of her classmates, of Millie in one of her classmates. Um, is this a bump on her head? No. It's not? No. You didn't report that to anyone? No. And she was adopted at them, so I don't need to report it to anyone if there was a, a bump. Okay, but as, as there was, if there was a bump, um, isn't it true that what we're seeing is not, is in fact highlight, the highlight caused by the light? Well, I'm not sure what, I don't see anything on there, so I'm not sure. The light color, if I may. Yes. I'm not sure you this right here is caused by the light, isn't it? Okay. This is the light bouncing off of her, isn't it? Okay. Yeah. I have nothing for it. question. That is um, Hannah and um, a family friend. And uh, Hannah is, again, just for the record, the child that was named Mercy, yes. correct? Um, at this time, Your Honor, I would tender into uh, evidence defendants exhibit 16. Your Honor, student objects to relevancy. And, and it's not a child that is shown in this case. And family friend? Yes. Your Honor, this goes to, again, to lineage and to show um, certainly some of the features of the child that are similar to the f features in Layla. And um, just want to show them at the same age as Layla. Well, the relevant standard is not high. Uh, I'll admit it, let's work. Thank you, Your Honor. If I may, you are, if you, you're admitting defendant 16, may, can, I, may I publish? You may. Thank you. What age is this picture of Hannah? I don't remember specifically when it was taken. I would say maybe a little less than a year. A little less than a year. Maybe, you know, somewhere right around her. First birthday. And she looks different now, doesn't she? She's older. And her face has grown out. Mm -hmm. She's grown out of the baby fat in her face. Well, she's st no, she's she still <laughs> she still has chubby cheeks. But she's she doesn't have cheeks that look like this right now, do they? It might be slightly different. Thank you. I have nothing further. Experience with now parenting um, young children. Do young children sometimes lie? Yes. And when Millie um, would tell you lies, those would be about little things, as you said. Yes. Um, and your concerns regarding some of the things that either Millie said, that's not necessarily the same thing as them being untrue, is it? Okay, exactly. Yes. Now, Millie got in trouble, I believe you indicated, maybe two times for lying at school. Mm -hmm. uh, what grade is Millie in now? Uh, she'll be going into second grade. Second grade. Second or third? No, she's going into second, second grade. Second? Mm -hmm. 
So she's been in school kindergarten, mm -hmm. first grade, mm -hmm. second grade? She's going into second grade. And she's gotten in trouble twice for lying? That, yes, specifically. Mm -hmm. And what were those? Um, um, the only one that I remember specifically was um, something to do with classwork, and she was supposed to be going and doing classwork. She grabbed um, one of the classroom iPads and was in with another group that she was supposed to be um, she was supposed to be in a different group, and she um, was saying that she didn't know that she was supposed to be in that group, in a different group than where she was. And so the teacher was like, I know I told you, so you do know. And she, and she like, the teacher said that's what it was. So in all those three years, that was the lie she got The ones that I can, yeah, that come to mind, yeah. And when... Millie pushed Hannah. Um, did Hannah have any injuries? She might have had a she might have had a bump. Anything that you had to take her to the hospital for? No. Um, do you do the siblings sometimes fight? Yes. Overhead, what's been marked as State's Exhibit 78. Did Millie ever come back from Peggy Banks's home with that type of bruise? No. If you had seen that type of bruise on Millie when she came home from Peggy Banks's, would you have taken her to the hospital? Yes. Would you have made a report? Yes. Would you have been concerned? Yes. And I'll show you what's been previously marked as State's Exhibit. Eighty. Did Millie ever come from Peggy Banks with injuries like that? No. Has Millie ever had a type of injury like that in your care? No. Have you ever, if you had ever seen an injury like that on Millie or any of your other children, would you have been concerned? Absolutely. Would you have made a report? Absolutely. Would you have taken them to the hospital? Absolutely. So all the questions I have. Thank you. All right. Thank you. Thank you. No, you're on. Let's go ahead and take our 15 minute morning break and then we'll come back. Thank you.